most terrific keynote introductory speaker is my ambassador Julie Turner, uh, who is, of course, as you all know, the U.S. Special Envoy for North Korean Human Rights since October of 2023. She has been a, um, well, not only fantastic U.S. diplomat, but a terrific promoter of this cause. Everyone in the CSO community loves Ambassador Turner, myself included. Uh, thank you so much, Julie, for your support for the cause. Uh, we are very happy that you're with us today. And uh, Ambassador Turner, I'm just going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Greg. It's great to be back here at the Death Moore Bacon House, uh, celebrating the release of another important report from HRNK. Um, you said that civil society loves me. It's good to be loved by someone, especially when the North Koreans are out there calling me names like the apostle of aggression, which I think is a great um, tie-in to today's uh, uh, topic, uh, linking international peace and security and human rights. So I'd also uh, like to acknowledge and thank Bob Collins for another excellent report uh, that really shows his commitment to this issue, the time and passion and energy that goes into producing uh, such a comprehensive report as this one. Um, thank you for all you do to promote North Korean human rights and also to promote um, a better understanding and information on, on North Korea as a whole. So the report opens with the following line. Human rights are not only a moral imperative, but also a national security issue. And on that, I couldn't agree more. Along with our South Korean counterparts, we've been very outspoken over the past few years in our belief that the DPRK human rights issues and the DPRK security issues are inextricably linked. Or as my friend Ambassador Yishin Hua likes to say, two sides of the same coin. Um, these issues cannot be addressed in isolation. The DPRK continues to exploit its own citizens and divert resources from the country's people to build up its unlawful WMD and ballistic weapons program. In general terms, I think the case here is fairly intuitive. It's the DPRK, DPRK's repressive political climate that allows the government to divert such a large share of its budget and resources to weapons without comment from the population, which continues to suffer from severe economic hardships and malnutrition. Moreover, forced labor, both domestic and overseas, plays a key role in generating revenue that sustains the government in power and allows it to continue its weapons development. The DPRK's threats to international peace and security are not limited to weapons development, however, the DPRK has a long history of transnational repression, um, which we've seen in the form of extrajudicial killings, abductions, and transnational surveillance. It's, it targets escapees and defectors through intimidation and threats of reprisal to their families back home. We've all been seeing the recent reports again last month. Uh, the PRC repatriated, forcibly repatriated, large number of North Korean asylum seekers. And so on the U.S. government side, we continue, I don't know whether this is the mic or me, um, maybe I'm moving too much, but we continue to call on the PRC to abide by the principle of non reform The evidence for this is undeniable. Given the closed nature of the DPRK system, however, Many of the specific mechanisms of work have yet to be published or publicly illuminated, and the information in this report helps observers fill in one piece of that puzzle, linking these two pieces together. As I imagine most people here today are aware, last year we were successful in returning DPRK human rights issues to the UN Security Council's formal agenda for the first time since 2017. The session, which was in line with the recommendations of the landmark 2014 UN Commission of Inquiry report, was a watershed moment in international efforts to reinvigorate attention and activism surrounding the DPRK's egregious human rights record. In doing so, it was incumbent upon governments to make the case to other Security Council members 
that the GPRK's human rights practices were, in fact, a matter of international peace and security, and that they belong on the agenda in New York in addition to Geneva. Fortunately, this argument prevailed to the extent that high quality research, um, like the report that we're here to discuss today, is being produced about these linkages. It will help uh, make this process easier for us in the future um, in carrying forward those Security Council meetings and other important conversations in New York um, addressing North Korea's compliance uh, with UN treaty bodies. It is not just the United States and our South Korean allies who have been making this case. In February 2023, 62 UN member states signed a letter urging the Security Council to once again take up North Korean human rights issues as being inextricably linked to international peace and security. We're committed to addressing the full range of challenges posed by the DPRK, including both its human rights violations and abuses and its unlawful nuclear weapons and ballistic missile, missile programs. We continue to work with the international community to raise awareness of DPRK's human rights issues, document violations and abuses, counter DPRK transnational repression, and increase the free flow of an independent information into, out of, and within the DPRK. We will shine a light on the DPRK's coercive labor practices, both within its borders and among the workers it sends abroad to labor in mining, logging, seafood processing, information technology, and other industries. Where possible, we will also address these concerns through sanctions, import restrictions, business advisories, and other tools that the US government has available to us, but also in partnership with like-minded partners. We will also continue to pursue dialogue with the DPRK, including on human rights issues. And so, um, again, a huge thanks to Bob and to Greg and the HRNK team um, for the work being done to uh, make more of this important research available, exposing the linkages between the human rights abuses and the security issues. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward to the rest of the conversation today. Ambassador Turner, the right work. A while back, your appointment, your confirmation was such a great boost to this movement of North Korean human rights. Thank you very much. Uh, let me take my time to acknowledge a few people here. Chuck Downs was executive director of HRNK. He was my predecessor. In two months that we overlapped, it's not that I've done much, I haven't, but I learned more from Chuck than I learned, you know, in God, decades of undergraduate and graduate studies. So thank you, Chuck, and thank you for coming here today. You're a wonderful, wonderful, and so highly dedicated American patriot. So dedicated to our alliances. Come, Stanley, Peter, Grace, Jim Kelman, all of you, thank you. Uh, my apologies if I don't call you all by name, but I'm very happy that you're with us this afternoon. And, uh, of course, our young colleagues, uh, Alex, Kaiyoka, our intern, Colleen, our intern, and, of course, our wonderful Raymond Ha. Thank you so much for your good and hard work. And what can I say about our panel of experts tonight? Um, Ambassador Robert Joseph, um, co-vice chair of the board. HRNK, Bob, thank you for your leadership on an issue that's so relevant this afternoon and every day. The nexus between human rights and security, and this is what we're trying to highlight here. Dave Maxwell, great patriot, great friend, great board member, thank you. George Hutchinson, a key member of the International Council on Korean Studies, Dr. Hutchinson, thank you for joining us today. And Bob Collins, this is your 10th report, isn't it? 10 reports. So Bob has been critical in one of all fundamental fields of expertise, the link between regime dynamics and the policy of human rights denial. So this has been a key area of what HRK has been doing. And, you know, we'll just keep doing it. That's who we are. That's at the very core of our identity. 
Ambassador Turner, thank you very much. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Robert Collins, and then we'll go to our distinguished discussants. Thank you. Well, you know, where should we go? Um, I gotta say that I'm pretty humbled. and a bit emotional, as you can tell. Why did I do this report? It took 10 years to write this and edit it. Because I didn't want to get anything wrong. I had plenty of information that was coming in and I found that it was wrong. And so I rejected it. That's why it took so long. We, our government, our organizations need to understand the threat as well as they possibly can from the North Korean nuclear scientists. We can all worry about a nuclear warfare with North Korea, but let's talk about what happened with Russia or Soviet Union when they fell apart and their nuclear scientists went all over the world spreading the the ability and knowledge to make nuclear weapons. And they did that in North Korea also. And so if we don't identify these people in North Korea in terms of who they are and what they went through and how we how we should address them, then our government is not is not appropriately understanding how to control these individuals when they go to places like Myanmar or wherever and spread the ability to make nuclear weapons in countries that, that are so tiny and but, but capable because they have a few scientists to make it happen. We have to control that. And that's what this report is. That's the reason that I wrote this report. Let me thank HRNK for helping me do this. It's a 10 year project. It took 10 years to do this. Let me also thank Ambassador Turner for her comments and uh, uh, keynote address. I appreciate that. But if, if you leave this room with no other thoughts, it's we must control these nuclear scientists from getting out of control uh, and going to uh, other countries and spreading the ability to make nuclear weapons for countries that really don't care but can, control, but can kill millions with their knowledge. Mm -hmm. that's, what the, that's the reason to put this report out, and I hope you all understand that. These individuals, uh, this is really tragic. Imagine your son or daughter being told in sixth grade this is what he or she must do for the rest of their life. You have no control as a parent. You have no control as, uh, of your family. They must do what the party tells them to do. Not the state, but the Korean Workers' Party. And they tell them that because your sixth grade teacher identifies you as being the smartest kid in the class, then you and it reports that up to the party chains to the Korean Science Education Department, not science and education, science education. And from that point on, after sixth grade, they go to a number one school. That's the name of the school, a number one school, both in terms of the city level, the provincial level, um, and uh, the county level. And so if you've got an IQ of like 150, uh, or something close to that, then you're, you're off to go to that, that particular school and your parents go with you. And the, after that, if, you go to, if you're doing well, then you go to a number one high school, same levels. And after that, you go to one of five institutions, uh, college institutions that teaches nuclear engineering or nuclear science or quantum mechanics, nuclear chemistry, things of that nature. And then you graduate from there, and then you are transferred to the party, not the state, not the military. You transfer to the party organization called the Munitions Industry Department. They assign you to wherever they think they need you to work, whether it's from a uranium mine, or the Yongbyon reactor, or the place where they build the bombs, any of those places. I mean, there's a, there's a, it's detailed in the book here about where they can be assigned. And they all have to work under party leadership, not military, not state, but party leadership, and what it is they have to do in order to produce the capability 
to use nuclear weapons against South Korea, Japan, and the United States. Um, now, there's a parallel organization, obviously, that's responsible for that, and that is the North Korean missile scientists, who go through a similar process, very similar. They're just parallel. But this is not about the nuclear, the, this is not about the, the missile scientists, it's about the nuclear scientists. But whatever you read in this report that is relative to the, the uh, uh, parallel <coughs> control of the party state, uh, that, that's the same. The difference is the missile scientists don't have to work with radiation problems. And that is the biggest human right violation within the program. I've talked to hundreds of North Koreans and the talked to the highest level, the version of the Korean CIA's version of a, of a think tank um, to try and find out who's who and whatnot. Is there a nuclear scientist that ever defected? Well, they won't tell you because it's too sensitive. But I have talked to family members like wives who have defected after their husbands have died um, and uh, what they went through is just amazing. Writing the report had to cause a lot of problems in terms of was it truthful what you heard or what you found? Many times it was not. But when you talk to the wives of scientists who die from radiation poisoning, it's hard to ignore that. Um, I mean, that's very realistic in terms of the suffering that they go through. Uh, and that's why this is, you know, this, this report is so important is to understand what these people go through. So if there is a collapse of the regime and the scientists find freedom to go leave country, where they go is important because of the knowledge that they have, that, you know, go, go to some other country and, and spread this knowledge that may eventually result in a nuclear strike on the United States. That's why it's important to us. Um, and I'm sure that all, everybody in this room knows that. The development of these young kids when they're in sixth grade, and they're the smartest kids in not only their class, but their schools and within the country. These, these kids are now on a, track, a road track where they can't control any aspect of their life. Where they go and work after they graduate from uh, you know, either nuclear chemistry or nuclear uh, quantum mechanics or, or, or nuclear engineering, wherever they go, um, they, they have to stay on that track. They can't go anyplace else. They can't go out and work at McDonald's or they can't go out and you know, become a landowner or anything of that nature. That doesn't happen. They don't have any freedom whatsoever. They have to do exactly what the party state tells them. It's the party rather than the state. Having said all that, the reason I wrote this was out of fear. Fear that these scientists would escape somehow and they were going to you know, contribute to some sort of strike, a nuclear strike on either the United States or one of its allies. That's why I wrote the report. It took, it, 10 years was worth it. I want to say that um, all of these nuclear scientists suffer greatly because of their exposure to radiation, which the regime has not shown a, a adequate care for the health of these individuals. And so you have wives of the family members of these individuals telling you about the radiation burns that they have on their skin and what kind of uh, hihenga, a child that is, is deformed because of the radiation. A lot of these uh, 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 individual um, children are deformed when they grow up in, in, in the city of Bundang. You've all heard of the Yongbyon nuclear reactor, which is just south and southwest of that is the city of Bundang. That's where most of them live. And their rate of uh, getting radiation sickness of the cities of Bundang is one of the highest in the world. It's just, it's just amazing. Um, but that's where most of them live. Uh, and that's where they suffer the most. Um, and, when, and when you talk about Bungedi, which is where they did their, most of their nuclear testing, the citizens around there all have the same problem in terms of radiation sickness. I mean, it's really quite disgusting. We put our nuclear program out in the middle of the desert so that it didn't impact um, 
you know, people, American citizens, either in New Mexico or in Nevada. Um, but the point is, is that uh, the regime did not take care to protect its own scientists. Um, and we're talking thousands of, of those that are either chemists or mathematicians or, or, or whatever. Um, many of them, many of them suffer. I think the last thing that I want to say um, is the United Nations have to protect ourselves in controlling these citizens, however, these are North Korean scientists and technicians, however it works out, to ensure that they don't carry this knowledge to countries that can attack us in the future 10 years from now. 10 years ago, we didn't worry, we weren't worried, 20 years ago, we weren't worried about that much because they hadn't advanced the program to all that much. Now they have. Um, you know, and we just keep putting it off and keep putting it off as, as both as a, as a defense uh, strategy or as a government strategy. Now um, we have a, a very direct threat. Can they put a missile, excuse me, can they put a nuclear warhead on a missile and, a, and send it to the United States? Well, they haven't proven that they can drop a, a warhead, in, you know, from you know, 4,000 kilometers in the air, I mean, it won't, it won't survive, it'll blow, it'll blow off before it even lands. It's the temperature. Yeah, you know, the temperature is the problem. So uh, they haven't proven that yet. But they didn't prove anything when they did their test. Bill Clinton, on in November of, of 93, stated that um, if North Korea uses a nuclear weapon against the U.S., its ally South Korea, or any other country, or any ally in, in the group, that would be the end of the regime. There are plenty of individuals in North Korea that know how to um, conduct the warfare, what to target, how to use it, what's the most dramatic, uh, uh, important uh, targetry that they could do in order to try and defeat us as an alliance. Uh, that's pretty complicated. The USS Ohio class submarine has 124 missiles that can destroy all the headquarters of anything that's going on in North Korea. And they know that, but um, not everybody understands that. Here's the most important thing that I'm going to say. How do we, as the world's most powerful country, dissuade Kim Jong-un for using a nuclear weapon? How do we do that? And that has to be a complete understanding of what the threat is to them um, and uh, what is the result if they go ahead and use a nuclear weapon. That's one of the reasons that I wrote this report, to understand who these people are that are doing that. And so from that point on, I think I'll just stop and turn it back over to Greg. An extraordinary honor and a privilege to work on this report together. It has been a long time, it's taken longer than the Manhattan Project. Uh, well, <laughs> it's, been, it's a fantastic report, and you know what can we say? You you mentioned a couple of things, you know, a couple of names. Let me remind everyone that the the board of HRNK is fully bipartisan and non nonpartisan. Our politics is non you know North Korean human rights. We want to bring democracy, human rights, freedom economic prosperity to all Korean people. That's our political agenda. That's what we do. Um, and that said, I'm, I'm so humbled to introduce uh, again our discussants. And I think Ambassador Joseph, I'm going to go to you next, sir. Okay. Do I need to do anything with my mic or it's all right? Well, good afternoon, everyone. Great. Thank you for inviting me. It's always a privilege to uh, be participating in the events that you sponsor. And of course, it's an honor to be on the HRNK board. Uh, Bob, congratulations on a terrific report. I think, once again, you've done it. Uh, you have provided us through your meticulous research with uh, very important insights, information, I would say knowledge, <laughs> about not only North Korean human rights violations, uh, but also the nuclear program, a program that, as you point out in the report, dates back to the early 1950s. And since that time, it's been only about nuclear weapons. 
It's not about the benefit of the North Korean people through nuclear energy. It's about weapons and what nuclear weapons can, can provide. As we all know, there are two principal pillars of the Kim dynasty. One being the human rights denial of the captive population of North Korea. And the other being nuclear weapons. And I think your report makes a real contribution by identifying key nodes in the nexus of these two pillars, the interrelationships of these two pillars. And I think in that way, we'll make a lasting contribution. I'd like to make just a few points uh, that I think contribute to sound policy uh, regarding both human rights and the nuclear program that I extracted from the report. One thing that perhaps should not have surprised me, but did rather, uh, was the pervasive role of the party in denying the human rights and those associated with the nuclear program. The forced recruitment that you remember, that you, that you uh, referred to, Bob, including students in elementary education, the regiment training, the assigned employment, every aspect of their lives, and those of their families. Before reading the report, I assumed that given the central importance of nuclear weapons to the Kim regime, the scientists, engineers, and other nuclear-related workers would be treated as a favored class. And I know the report points out that some individuals, some of those involved in the nuclear complex, uh, do have, by North Korean standards, rather lav lavish lifestyles, including high-rise apartments in Pyongyang. But the vast majority, and I think you put the number 6,000 uh, on, on those uh, involved in the nuclear program, the vast majority uh, are denied their fundamental human rights. They're denied through, their, through surveillance, through regimentation, through dangerous working conditions, especially in terms of radiation, and through intimidation, the very dignity that we that we uh, seek to provide through improvement of the human rights situation uh, in, in North Korea. From a proliferation standpoint, standpoint, the report provides important insights on nuclear-related foreign assistance from Russia, from Pakistan, especially through H. Khan, but also through China. And there's a triangular relationship there that I think we need to take into account. And of course, the ongoing interactions with the Mullahs regime in, in Tehran. But we talk about the primary motivation of this was your concern with regard to what might happen if North Korea implodes. What happens to the scientists? How do we prevent those scientists from contributing to nuclear programs, nuclear weapons programs of other countries, particularly those who uh, would be uh, hostile to the United States? and could arm those countries with nuclear weapons that could be used against us. Well, I was very much involved in the same predicament that you anticipate for the future with the fall of uh, the Soviet Union. And there was a clear recognition that this huge complex, and it's a WMD complex, as you, as you point out, Bob, it's not just nuclear. It's nuclear, it's biological, it's chemical, it's missiles. It's, it, it, it's a huge complex. But there was a recognition that we were particularly, that what was particularly important to us was to have some control over the scientists, the nuclear scientists and, and engineers in a number of, in a number of re related fields. At that time, even though we had a number of key individuals identified, through our intelligence and through the diplomatic relationships that we had had. I, I, I had at one point, I headed the nuclear testing negotiations with the then Soviet Union. And that of course was on both sides, uh, uh, one uh, negotiation that was uh, populated uh, by scientists in the nuclear field. Uh, and so we had, we had some uh, understanding of the key individuals. But it's an enormous complex. And I think we had, in fact, only a small fraction of those scientists, engineers, technicians that could do us harm. And there was no, at the time, there was no sense of priority. 
in terms of which individuals present the greatest threat. And think about it, okay, I mean, there are a lot of different fields that come together. Uh, but some individuals at key sort of spots in the, in, in, in the nuclear weapons program present an even greater threat than most of the others. And we tried to go through that analytic process. I wonder about if, if you know, we could take some of the lessons learned from that experience, which are not all positive by any chance, okay, by, by any means, but we could take some of the lessons learned from that experience and, and apply it to North Korea. I don't know that we're doing this now. My sense is that we're probably not. And Bob, I think I would give you the highest compliment by providing sort of a blueprint, providing a directory of individuals. It's a start. I'm sure there are holes in it. I'm sure, I'm sure, but, it, but it's, it's the start that we didn't have with the fall of the Soviet Union. And so I couldn't compliment you enough for, for doing that. Uh, it's a, you know, it's, it's a hard problem. Uh, in the true American way, we threw a lot of money at the problem. Uh, we emptied out our uh, national uh, nuclear laboratories, and sent just about all of them over on, over to the Soviet Union to do whatever. Uh, probably some of that effort uh, was, was useful. Uh, but I think we could do a lot better with North Korea. And I think the threat is real, as you point out. Because my sense is that at some point, I don't know when, and I don't know what the spark will be, but North Korea will follow the path of all totalitarian states. And there will be an end to it. And no one, I think, can really predict how that's going to be, but I think we can predict that it's going to be messy. And, it's, and, it's, and, and I think that we can predict that some of those states that we're most concerned about will actually seek the employment of North Korean and engineers and other, and, and other uh, technology, uh, technical, uh, ex technical experts in the nuclear, biological, and chemical. I, I would personally make the argument that the bio biological threat is equal to that of the, of the nuclear threat. Uh, and I uh, differ from, from you on one point, and that is I believe that North Korea does have the capability to strike the United States. They're not, they're not going to test a ballistic missile and a re-entry vehicle with a live nuclear weapon. They're not, they're not going to do that. Nobody does that. Okay? And they've had how many years now to perfect that technology, and they've done pretty well. And as we point out in the report, Bob, that you were part of, and Dave was part of, and Greg was part of, along with Joe Detrani and Olivia Enos and, uh, and Nick Everstadt, uh, North, North Korea in three years from now, could have as many as 200 nuclear weapons. And we also need to think about what happens to those weapons. Uh, we thought about it with regard to the Soviet Union, the security situation, the safety, and, and, and quite frankly, the safety uh, aspects of the nuclear weapons were highly questionable. Uh, the chemical weapons were, were a total disaster. You remember President Obama going to uh, a chemical weapons munition site in uh, in Russia, uh, as part of the non Lugar, in fact, he went with Senator Lugar, uh, and that's that's what convinced him of the of the gravity of the threat. Uh, and you know, the biological is, is the same, and I think we know so little about the biological program in in, uh, uh, in North Korea. Uh, we thought we knew about the Russian or Soviet program, but lo and behold, when the Cold War ended, we found out that no, it was. 10 times or 50 times larger than we had anticipated. That they had, that they had uh, facilities and they had incredible investments uh, in developing uh, uh, agents that we couldn't even conceive of. Agents that they would put on SS-18 missiles to follow a, a full-scale nuclear strike just to make sure that nobody lived. I mean, they, these, you know, these countries think differently than we do. These leaderships think differently than we do. And we need to take, take that into account. Uh, but Bob, I do, I do congratulate you. I think your work fits very well with the effort that, uh, that, uh, that I mentioned in terms of the strategic uh, 
plan that we put out last year, which puts human rights up front uh, in a comprehensive strategy. Uh, and I think uh, that, well, I think I'll stop there. And once again, just congratulate you because I think you've made a real contribution to our defense for the future. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, I would like to say one thing uh, about the biochemical warfare capability of North Korea. I've done a lot of research on that, a lot of writing on that. I have published anything in HRK on that issue. But easily, the dirtiest, filthiest, biochem-related city in the entire world is Hong Kong on the east coast of North Korea. I mean, it is full of uh, chemical, and that's where North Korea does all this chemical and biological research, and they are not careful. I'll leave it at that for the moment. Just maybe I can convince him we'll that's our next report. You know, Bob, I, I would just make one other point. This dates to when I was at the White House and working in North Korea with him. And I would read through the intelligence. And I was doing weapons of mass destruction. And the intelligence on North Korea was beyond my imagination. And I hope it's beyond the imagination of anyone in terms of what they were developing and how they were testing what they were developing. And I'll just leave it at that. But it's truly inhuman. Yeah. Truly inhuman. Ambassador Joseph, thank you very much. North Korea is not an abstraction. North Korea is threatening international peace and security with the exportation of artillery shells from the North Korean port of Arasona to Dunai in the Russian Far East, all across the Russian South via rail to the Rostov Oblast, close to the Ukrainian front. Okay, some of them blow up in the barrel, some of them don't blow up, but the Russians are outshelling the Ukrainians five to one, 10,000 versus 2,000 a day. It's a great point you're making, sir. Ballistic missiles, KN-23, 24, different story. Uh, those are working pretty well. Uh, the North Koreans have been proliferating to Hamas, Hezbollah, to the Houthis via their Iranian allies. We are trying to establish this connection between a regime that doesn't care about the human rights of their people, a regime that violates the human rights of their people, despite their domestic and international obligations and the proliferation risks that they pose. Thank you, sir, for making the great point. We'll uh, move on to our next speaker, uh, Colonel Maxwell, sir, another wonderful HRNK board member. All HRNK board members are wonderful. But Dave, thank you so much for joining us. Please go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you, Greg. Thank you to HRNK, and of course, thank you to my good friends. Uh, Bob Collins. Um, I, I just want to start off making a couple points that, um, you know, we're here in the nexus of, of weapons of mass destruction of the nuclear program and human rights. Um, and I think everybody in this room, by virtue of you being here, that you are have a great interest in human rights. And I appreciate that and I applaud that. But for those who don't think about this, I think it's really important to see that, uh, that how human rights are affects the decision-making of Kim Jong-un. Um, Ambassador Turner and Ambassador Lee and, and both countries have really put a lot of pressure on Kim Jong-un. The report from HRNK on the, the use of, of slave workers in the seafood industry has resulted in, according to the Daily NK today, changes for the workers. Now, They've gone from five to 10 minute breaks to 30 minute breaks. You know, we consider that a small victory, but they're reacting to that pressure. And, and I just make that point because every time we talk about human rights, it undermines the legitimacy of the regime. And every time we talk about the strength of its nuclear program, we reinforce the legitimacy of the regime, or they exploit that, that uh, and, and they use it to, to their benefit. I would say, and I would recommend this to all of our political leaders, is that whenever we have to address the nuclear program, we must also include statements such as the people in North Korea are suffering 
and sacrificing because Kim Jong Un prioritizes the development of nuclear weapons, and weapons of mass destruction, and advanced weaponry over the welfare of the people. And I think in uh, in 2022 they spent about 615 million dollars on missile tests, about 60 missile tests. And I think the World Food Program estimated they had about a 415 million dollar shortfall in food. I don't like to do public math, but uh, it sure seems like there could be better priorities if you're concerned about the Korean people. And so I, I just I can't emphasize enough how important it is for the work that HRK does and Ambassador Turner does and, and all the like-minded people who are concerned with the welfare of the Korean people in the, in the North. What is also important to note is that Kim Jong-un is under a lot of internal pressure now. Why is that? Well, because of the failed promise. You know, we are very concerned with the growth of nuclear weapons and the potential for employment. But Kim Jong-un and Kim Jong-il before promised the Korean people that with nuclear weapons, they would have peace and prosperity. That promise has failed. And, and because he's not able to live up to that promise, I believe what we're seeing right now is Kim Jong-un trying to externalize the threat something I learned from, from Bob, is externalize the threat so that he can continue to justify the sacrifices and suffering of the Korean people in the North. And so the nuclear program is at once, um, you know, the, the treasured sword and the key to survival, uh, but it is also the key to the people's suffering. Uh, and, and it has caused the people to suffer. Now, let me just talk about my, my good friend, Bob Collins, you know, the words you hear sometimes, uh, but uh, words that are really, truly meaningful, uh, and I say this with all sincerity, is Bob is a national treasure. And we, the, the contributions that he has done, uh, has made over really five decades to the problems in Korea are just, you know, are without equal, without equal. Um, and when I first met Bob in the 1990s in, in Korea, um, the famine, the Great Famine, the arduous march was taking place. And Bob had, had written the seven phases of North Korean collapse and laid out all the indicators for instability in North Korea. Uh, and and those, that work that he did as the foundation for how we look at the problem in, in North Korea. Um, and of course, the things that we are concerned about, loose nukes, um, you know, what happens in uh, you know, internal infighting or refugees, uh, and of course, the humanitarian disaster that is North Korea, all of that went into, in, went into planning. And it's no wonder that, that Bob had embarked on this program or this report because, you know, there is, I mean, this is an incredibly complex problem. And what Bob has done has made a contribution to the U.S. government, to the South Korean government, uh, that is, frankly, not rivaled from within the government. Uh, he has produced this report that really shows, lays out the nuclear scientists you know, and, and everything about them. And in military terms, you know, this could be what's called a target list. You know, when, when something happens inside North Korea, these are the people that need to be apprehended. They need to be controlled. They need to be prevented from leaving the country and selling their knowledge to other places. And so. This work is really the foundation for that kind of planning. Now, Bob, you know, able to, to get the information, to put this information together, why, why is that? Well, for those of you that don't know Bob, he is uh, a brilliant Korean linguist, and not only speaks Korean, but he's able to develop rapport with, uh, with defectors, escapees, because he can speak in their dialect. And, and those escapees trust him, you know, and they provide you know, valuable information because of his ability to establish that rapport and that trust, uh, and they willingly provide that information because they know it is is going to be put to good use. You know, I often start my lectures by saying that uh, uh, there are no experts on North Korea, uh, but Bob is truly an, an expert. Uh, he is really, uh, you know, there may be less than, you know, I can put on one hand here, and, and 
Bob is, is really, truly one. Um, so we have these, th this report, and, uh, and I'm always concerned with operationalizing it. And so um, I've said one way how to use the report uh, as a target list, but the other way is influence. The other way is to influence decision making. And whether it's in armistice now or, God forbid, during war. And by understanding the relationships, the personalities, the people involved in the entire program, it should give, and I, I believe it does, if I were still in the government, you know, I would want to use this report to help shape an information program uh, to really influence uh, at all levels uh, throughout the nuclear architecture there to try to impact the decision making. You know, and of course, the number one thing we want to impact is the prevention of the decision to use nuclear weapons. Uh, but, you know, they may be used. So this report really gives us both the target list of who to go after, but also how to influence. So I, I just have a, a couple questions that I'd like to, uh, I think are, are really worth, um, you know, fleshing out here uh, and, and for Bob to really give us uh, uh, some, some additional insights. The one, the one thing that really, um, you know, we know that they began their nuclear, their nuclear program in the 1950s. You know, of course, 2006 when they tested their first device. Why did it take so long? And I think I think that's really a, an important insight. And, and what what prevented them? Uh, and you know, on the one hand, what prevented them? And then, but also thinking about how um, you know austere the country is, how isolated they are, that they were in fact able to make that that breakthrough. Uh, so I think that's, that's really a question about I think is worth uh, worth it. If you'd like to answer it now, I'd... go ahead. Yeah. Um, thank you for the question, Dave. I appreciate that. The most dramatically influential part of every North Korean's life is that they are controlled by the party in so many different ways on an individual basis, um, and so. For control purposes, under Kim Il Sung and Kim Jong Il, not Kim Jong Un. For control purposes, Kim Jong Il would not let individual teams within the nuclear program to cooperate with each other. What do I mean by that? Any nuclear program has a team of nuclear chemists, and they have a team of nuclear engineers and they have a team of uh, various nuclear capabilities that they all have to work together in order to produce a bomb. For instance, um, the nuclear engineer doesn't know the chemistry that goes into making the, the device explode. That's a chemistry thing. The engineer is the one who divine, uh, uh, devises the, uh, the bomb itself and how it, how it is uh, built itself and how, uh, you know, what's gonna happen when it drops onto um, the, the target, um, it's got to build that. Uh, when it's mounted on a missile, it's got to build that. But they're not chemists, they don't control that. Um, and then you have the quantum mechanics, and then the, the guy that does not quantum mechanics, he's got to, um, he or she has got to uh, uh, organize all this in order to make sure that the, uh, the, the efficiency of the bomb, but also the bomb's ability to withstand uh, the issues that are ranging from being on top of a missile and going someplace and going through the atmosphere and surviving and whatnot. So all these teams have to work together. Kim Jong, Kim Jong Il, Kim Jong Un's father, would not let these teams organize within themselves because he didn't trust their politics. You'd have a three-man team of engineering and a three-man team of chemistry and a three-man team of quantum mechanics and they can't cooperate, they can't work together, then they're not gonna be able to do anything that advances the program. And that's, that's the reason why it took so long. And this is a direct result of Kim Jong-il's leadership um, from the 70s through the early 2000s. Kim Jong-un was not like that. He was, he was, he was uh, educated in Switzerland. He has a Western understanding of how things are done scientifically, and he's done a far better job in terms of organizing how these how these uh, teams cooperate, and that's why they've made the advances in the last 20 years. But for the lat latter half of the, uh, 
um, uh, the, la the latter half of uh, the 20th century uh, has been terrible. I'll give you one great example. Sosan Guk, that's his name. He goes to Russia's number one nuclear science institute, JINR, Joint Institute for Nuclear Research, outside Moscow. He goes there and uh, the, the Koreans all, 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 always send teams of three and they all sleep in the same same room because they all watch each other. They're debriefed by the, 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 you know, the state security guys, you know, the super spies of North Korea, and they report on each other. So you have to be very careful what you say. And so Sun Gook was so, so good as being a student. He excelled way beyond. The Russians were totally impressed with this guy and wanted to hire him. And they told him, we want to hire you. And so, he, uh, so some guy, he goes out and he has a few drinks and says, oh, this is wonderful, you know, they want to hire me. You know? And, and uh, um, he tells his other two guys, the other two guys he's uh, there with and staying with, and they tell the, the state security de department about uh, uh, this guy's bragging about going to work for the Russians. So he goes back to North Korea and what happens? He goes to a pig farm and shovels you know what. And, he, and that, that's because he's bragging about this and it's not what the, you know, they want to do this. So Kim Il-sung in 1980 goes to Moscow and says, we need some more help. This is, you know, 15 years later. We need more help. We need to do this. And so, was it Brezhnev? Andropov. Andropov. Andropov tells him that, well, why should we help you? You just, just taste the best guys that you have and you throw them in a pig farm. Why should we bother to help you? It's a waste of our time. Kim Il-sung said, what? What are you talking about? Well, guess what? His son, Kim Jong-il, is the one that threw him in the pig farm. Uh, and he didn't even know that. Kim Il-sung didn't even know that. So immediately the guy is taken out of the pig farm and made the head of nuclear research science at Kim Il-sung University. I mean, that, that, that is the politics that gets involved in, in, in making this happen and making it not happen. Excuse me, that's a better way to term it. I mean, th th that's why it took 50 years. It's because of the politics and the ideology of North Korea prevented it from being any, any efficiency that we took two and a half years to do in the Manhattan Project. Hope that answers your question, sir. So uh, to sum up, politics and loyalty to the regime yeah. are take precedence over technical and intellectual competence. Yeah. And I think that, that really, I mean, that, that's a, a lesson even beyond the nuclear program that, uh, that we want to we wanna understand. So. So what element in North Korea, what organization, if I was, if I was gonna target something for influence, what, what element is, is really responsible for overseeing the nuclear program? Can you describe that? There are a, a number of uh, channels, if you will, of authority over the nuclear program. Basically, the Korean Workers Party controls the program through its munitions industry department um, that oversees all weapons development. But the most important organization that oversees um, the nuclear program and where all the top scientists are is the 216th unit, uh, which operates out of Pyongyang. Now, the 216th, why? 216. What is 216 is the question. It's Kim Jong-il's uh, Kim Jong birthday. That's why it got the name. And that's a habit that the North Koreans have is they name things after, you know, the Kim family and, and whatnot. Um, but that, that organization, which headquarters out of Pyongyang, uh, has all the top nuclear scientists that are supervisory level. Now, we've all heard of, uh, of a person named Hecker in the U.S. nuclear program. Those are the Heckers of, uh, of North Korea that um, oper operate in Pyongyang and oversee the entire project. Um, and so any, uh, any developments that happen uh, are there. It's important to say this. All those scientists, they all have a military uniform. They're all three star or above. What does that mean? Why is that important? Because they're a justified target for any war that we go to in terms of destroying an enemy or targeting an enemy. They're not civilians, they're military targets. Well, that's an important, uh, an important distinction to keep in mind, mm. as Kim Jong-un himself is the marshal 
mm -hmm. leading the North Korean People's Army. That's right. So, so if I if I was going to try to influence Kim Jong Un not to use his nuclear weapons, you know, to, to not make the decision uh, to employ you know to launch nuclear weapons, who would I go to? How would I how would I influence that person or or persons to influence Kim Jong Un to prevent uh, you know to prevent the use of nuclear there is one person that stands out uh, over and above everybody else. The Politburo has like a 27 members. The Central Military Committee has anywhere from 12 to 14 members. These are the most influential people within the uh, um, uh, within the uh, political party. Um, the organization department, the, the Politburo, the Central Military Committee, and the organization and guidance department are the three most powerful organizations in North Korea. The OGD, the Organization and Guidance Department, is one that monitors everybody in the country. But the, the, the Central Military Committee organizes <coughs> and determines uh, all military policy, and the, politic, and the Politburo obviously does, but all the Communist Party does, and that is influence economics or institutional aspects or whatever. But most of those individuals are yes men or yes women. And the most influential and the most knowledgeable person out of all that group, but this is easy because of his background. He used to be the Air Force commander. Now he is a, he is a five star and he is the Minister of Defense Engineering. And his name is Yi Byung Chol. If I was going to target, and we were getting ready to go to war with North Korea for whatever reason, if I was going to target somebody that was going to influence um, Kim Jong-un and his decision to use an atomic weapon, either in South Korea, the U.S., Japan, or whatever, the guy that could talk him out of it would be Yi byung chol hands down. He's got both the military expertise and he's got more party influential than any other person in, in, the, in the groups that I just uh, uh, identified. Um, and, and he's very, obviously, you don't, you don't, you don't get the four-star or five-star by not being smart, but he's got the experience, He's got the knowledge, and he's got, and he's even been punished twice, sent away to a pig farm for six months, where that's what Kim Jong Un likes to do with people that don't agree with him or do something that he doesn't like. He sends her to go shovel, you know what? And then he come back after six months and he puts them back in the same position. That that's something that Kim Jong Un does in order to punish people that don't agree with him or don't do what he don't satisfy his uh, uh, objectives. And uh, uh, this guy, whatever we do, don't target the, don't don't target this guy. Have this guy survive. They all have cell phones. That guy, just because you know where he's at by a cell phone, don't target this guy. We need him to influence Kim Jong Un not to use the nukes. Thank you, Bob. Yeah. I think uh, you know this incredible report, so valuable, um, and, and I really thank you for for doing all this work. Right well, that's terrific, Colonel Maxwell and Ambassador Joseph. Thank you very much. We'll go to our next discussion. And Bob, thank you. We will go to uh, Dr. George Hutchinson, a veteran of the U.S. Air Force. His Korean is so good, it upsets all of us Korean yeah. speakers. Uh, thank you, George, for joining this panel. And uh, home to you, sir. Please go ahead. Thank you so much, Greg. It's truly an honor to be here today. Uh, I'll keep my remarks brief so we can have plenty of time to get to the audience for questions. But first off, uh, a huge shout out to Bob and the HRNK team for their latest report. What they've managed to do, and I, I want, I'd like to confine my comments to you know, put, sort of put myself in the, in, the, in the shoes of the policy maker, the policy practitioner. What kind of use are you gonna get? So we've embellished this, we've talked about this, but what kind of use are you really gonna get out of this report? So what they've managed to do is link with this report North Korea's nuclear ambitions with, it, with its nuclear rights record in a truly novel way, something like this really doesn't exist. So in terms of filling in gaps in the literature, this is a remarkable contribution that really fills a gap in our current literature. Now the report, for those of you who get into the methodology of things, the report employs human terrain mapping as a tool to help us dive deep into the fabric of the human beings who are part of this program and understand the factors controlling the lives 
of the North during the North Korea. Scientists, the engineers, the workers, and it covers everything, as Ambassador Joseph mentioned, from their selection and indoctrination to the intense security measures they endure, all within a socio-political hierarchy that governs their lives from cradle to grave. And so the report starts with a historical perspective, and this is valuable for the reader that wants to get into the mind of why did this thing even happen. It starts, it traces back to Kim Il-sung, beginning with an original group of 80 scientists, and then maps out and expands them to today's generation, now numbering around 6,000. So importantly, it provides insightful details into Kim Il-sung's views, which were significantly shaped by three major events. Uh, he saw the utility of nuclear weapons, uh, the devastating impact of atomic bombs in 1945, the instantaneous destruction of Korea's colonial Prussia that made a huge impact. But he also experienced the direct threat of nuclear weapons use during the Korean War. That specter loomed over Kim Il-sung's head the entire time, the Chinese as well. And then lastly, he watched the superpowers, the US and the Soviet Union, race for nuclear supremacy throughout the Cold War. And these experiences, these perceptions combined utility, fear, power, and shaped Kim Il-sung's approach to North Korea's nuclear development early on. So it took time, but North Korea fully developed these capabilities. Now what's fascinating about this report is the additional light it sheds on North Korea's unwavering commitment to develop nuclear weapons, which, you know, just when you thought you figured out all the motivations that could possibly go into why they would develop nuclear weapons, that additional light is shed. And it's not just about regime survival. It's also tightly linked to maintaining a system that blatantly denies human rights, <clears throat> basic human rights. And this is where the role and the fate of North Korea's nuclear scientists, engineers, and workers comes into play. Now, why is this connection so critical? If I say anything that makes any sense that can be taken away today, hopefully this is it. My great takeaway from this report, and this is hugely important. Nuclear weapons, this is through the, through the viewpoint of North Korea, nuclear weapons are viewed as the guarantor of the DPRK's sovereignty against external threats. Yet, while North Korea's constitution, it's written in their constitution, and the bylaws of the Korean Workers' Party state that the sovereignty of the North Korean people resides with the people. The Constitution also clearly reveals that the people's rights are collective and thus subordinate to the state. Collective, subordinate to the state, and the state is controlled by the party uh, tightly, and the single party system supports only one supreme leader, creating highly centralized top-down governance where the leader's authority is uncontested. And of course, this results in total control, culturally, politically, economically, and socially. This is why North Korea is so sensitive about international criticism of its human rights. Because such criticism strikes at the heart of their national narrative on sovereignty a narrative which their nuclear program is designed to protect. And that's how it's interwoven. And that's, that's to me, the great value of this report. So as highlighted in the report, North Korea's nuclear scientists and workers symbolize this twisted story. On the one hand, they're the celebrated swordsmiths of the DPRK's nuclear capabilities, hailed as national heroes, tasked with advancing the research, development, and production of North Korea's prized weapons, in servitude to the supreme leader. Yet on the other hand, they represent members of a collective that are exposed to uh, harsh control for slavery, working under intense political pressure and terrible conditions, and facing significant health risks from the hazards at North Korea's nuclear facilities. 
compounded, of course, by significant lack of safety equipment. So this report makes a groundbreaking connection. It merges the narratives of nuclear pro proliferation on the one hand and human rights abuses on the other. And it provides us, if you're in the policy sphere, it provides us with a nuanced perspective to develop better scope the nuclear threat and human rights crisis in North Korea. And isn't it high time that these two issues were tackled together rather than one being discussed? Uh, the privilege of the other. And so this opens up several avenues for further inquiry. And I, I throw this out to just foster a little bit of thinking uh, from the audience. But how would the world handle a nuclear disaster in North Korea akin to Chernobyl? Who in the international community is responsible to step up? Do we even have working assumptions for such a scenario? And so if that doesn't disturb you enough, consider this. How, how about as North Korea expands production and fielding of nuclear weapons, what standards, if any, does its nuclear regulatory body actually adhere to? Who monitors that? And then to what extent are crimes against humanity actually being committed, especially against the workers assigned to the Hungary nuclear test site, but also the political prisoners at Camp 16 that uh, are used to maintain the test site. And then critically, and this gets back into the war fighting sphere, if North Korea's command and control structure were disrupted, how would authority over nuclear weapons be managed? Not only delegation authority, but also how would the tactical and operational levels cope without clear instructions from the top? Now I'll leave it right there. So thanks for your attention. Look forward to the discussion. Dr. Hutchinson, thank you very much. The terrific comments. This is such a wonderful panel on humble. Uh, Bob heard me speak on Southeastern Europe yesterday morning. I still you know, have a career ahead of me for my quick career studies. These guys are way too good. Uh, but uh, let me make a point, a very important point. Um, there is a growing CSO coalition civil society organization coalition that is demanding a new UN expert team on North Korea. So what are we asking for? Following up, you know, on this great comments, uh, we are asking for the UN General Assembly to commission an impartial and independent expert team on North Korea to focus on the connections between international peace and security and human rights abuses in North Korea. This expert team will report annually to UN member states and assist the UN General Assembly and Security Council in carrying out their respective mandates. You know the functions, collect, analyze, report this information, collect, consolidate, preserve, analyze information on both, uh, you know, security issues and human rights issues. Why is this necessary? Because the Russians vetoed a UN Security Council resolution to renew the mandate of the panel of experts. So, um, you know, this is a big mission ahead of us. We need the help of like-minded UN member states. No kidding, we need the help of the Republic of Korea. They are great friends, allies, and partners, but we do need more help. We do need the help of the Global South, and we're trying to work on the Global South, trying to do our best there. Um, so, you know, how would we do this? What about the, the time frame, the funding? You know, this would be what we were asking for, CSOs, a standing mechanism. Uh, this would not need annual renewal. The General Assembly can actually end the mandate of this mechanism when there is no longer a need for it. Uh, we're looking at funding. Um, okay, this can be funded from the UN regular budget. Um, it may have to rely on voluntary funding until this is included in the UN general budget. And even after, if we manage to include it in the UN general budget, of course, voluntary funding will be more than welcome.
So, you know, these efforts are all part of a, a grand strategic effort to uh, address both North Korean human rights violations and the, the grave political security challenges we're facing. Okay, thank you. Greg, I'd like to get Bob's view on three things. First, we've talked about motivations of North Koreans for having a nuclear weapon. Have you, in your research, detected any motivations for giving up their nuclear weapons? No. No, I thought that would be a brief. And I, I have an answer, but U.S. policy for 40 years has been based on, on, on the premise that they will give them up through negotiations if only we can find the right carrots and sticks. And we failed for 40 years. Yeah. And we're going to continue to fail uh, as I see sort of the next administration, no matter, no matter who wins. May I say something? The dynamics, the political dynamics within those of the elite, the yes men and yes women that I talked about, they're all about saying you can't give up the weapons. They, and that's the position they take. That's how they get, not only do they get promoted, but they get benefits by taking that position. If I were advising Kim Jong-un, I would, I would take the same position. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it makes sense for them to have it. It makes no sense for them to give it up. Yeah. For the regime, for the regime's right. survival. That's right. And that's how they put it, for the regime. The second question is based on my view that we've talked about threat of implosion, we've talked about other scenarios, we haven't sort of talked about the AQ Khan scenario mm -hmm. with North Korea. Now, given the tight regimentation, et cetera, et cetera, but you know, Pakistan is a pretty you know, the ISI, you know, they, they keep their eyes on nuclear scientists. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. I mean, AQ Khan had a certain sort of position within Pakistan uh, that probably none of these scientists or technicians or engineers have. But do you think that that is a threat that we need to be thinking about and looking for? And what would be the indicators? And it may not just be an individual rogue actor. Yeah. And there are many questions about AQ Khan and his relationship with Pakistan officials, but it, it may be a state sanction. There's lots of money in this. Okay. AQ Khan made a lot of money. Yeah. Okay. And his, and his network, each of the individuals made a lot of money. Private hotels, private airplanes, I, I mean, they, they have it all. Right? Right. Uh, do you see any, any, any threat from that perspective? Uh, no, I don't, because the Pakistanis, they have. In terms of uh, political control of their nuclear scientists, the, the, the control of the North Koreans by the organization the guidance department is pretty severe. Um, and uh, it, I don't know a lot about AQ Khan, but I know that the, 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 the security of Pakistani were not as controlling as, as the, uh, uh, the North Korean Organization of Guidance Department and the Ministry of State Security, which is their secret police, have on all the scientists. What do they do daily? I'll give you an example. Like the 216th that I was talking about earlier. These are all the top scientists in terms of quantum mechanics and nuclear chemistry and, uh, and whatnot. They all have to live in the same compound. And in the compound is a wall around it, and there's only one driveway that goes in, and there's a guy that takes down the, who this is, and what time he enters, and what time he comes back, and what time they go out, and whatnot, and who visits them. And this is all taken down by the gate guard and given to the, the uh, Ministry of State Security. And then the investigation comes in, and they monitor, okay, Mr. Joseph, what you, where would you go yesterday? What, who did you talk to? You know, that kind of thing. So that's the kind of control that they have. What if it's states sanctioned? What if the leadership is involved? Well, that's when they're told, you will do this. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And are there certain indicators that we should be looking at, our intelligence community and that others should be looking for in that context? They keep going, was out there operating for a good deal of time without us knowing about it. Yeah. And, you know, he had certain connections. I mean, he, he used the Air Force planes to take centrifuges to his customers, right? Yeah, right. Okay, so I mean, there was, there was some collusion there. A proven track record of collusion with other country scientists is the track record of sending 
your second grade scientists to study overseas, like in, in Manchuria, the, 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 one of the top uh, nuclear science uh, Chinese uh, universities. I can't remember the name right now. It's hard to pronounce. It starts with a name. But, uh, they go there. And, and when Harvey. they go there, what? Harvey. 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 Okay. And, uh, uh, and, and what they do is they go there and, and uh, they collect information and bring it back so they can tell the rest of it. They do the same thing in India. And uh, um, so, so they, they, they send these guys out and bring them back and then the top scientists contribute to, all right, that's the information I need. Because they tell those junior scientists what to go with. Um, they did the same in Ukraine before the war. Um, and, but, but at any rate, uh, that, that's what they do. They go out and get the information they need, and uh, it's all directed by Kim Jong Un, of course, with the with the uh, 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 guidance, obviously, and advice of this two sixteenth. That is a concern that I've had for some years. Yeah, uh, we're going to see more and more of that yeah. if North Korea gets into the business of selling nuclear weapons. Yeah, and if they have a two hundred weapon arsenal in two and a half years from now, yeah. which is projected as a possibility by, by the RAND Corporation. Yeah. We got a real problem that we're not prepared for. Couldn't like every time every time you speak, I learn and I'm just, you know, I'm just, uh, I, I just wish that uh, I knew you when I was in government. Uh, we probably could have had a few challenge policies. The last, the last thing that I would, and here's where we may very well disagree. You said something about Clinton and Obama saying if North Korea ever, they both said it, Bush said it, yeah, yeah. all the presidents said yeah, yeah. If, you know, if North Korea uses a nuclear weapon, we're going to turn them into glass, they won't survive, it's yeah. the end of everything. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's a bunch of bunk. Okay. I really do. I, I think there's nothing to that. I mean, how many, how many people in this room think we should use a nuclear weapon to destroy North Korea? How many people think we should do that? And I've been in the nuclear business for for, for for many years. And I just don't think it's a credible, a credible threat. I, you know. Sir, we don't disagree. We don't, okay. We don't. I, I had the impression you were saying no. there was something to that. I think this is important. There's an Ohio class submarine, each of which has 124 charging missiles. We have 10 of those. Three in the Atlantic Mediterranean, three in the Indo-Pacific, and two that's always in repair of some kind. We have that many warheads. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So 100, 124 times three warheads, not nuclear, just ultra possible. If you would take that many, three times 124, and you attack every single headquarters munitions, whether it is at the battalion, the brigade, the regiment, Division, the core, or the, or, the, or the higher headquarters, and you strike every one of those, within one day, they will no longer be able to communicate with each other. That's what the Ohio class submarine can do by itself. We're not even talking about bombers. We're not even talking about missiles that come from Montana. We're just talking about what the submarines can do. We can destroy them in 24 hours. And that's really all we need to do. We don't need to. I, I hope I hope you're right, and I don't know that it's that I agree that we don't need to use nukes. I just don't think that we are likely to use nukes. Uh, I just add to that point: if we use nukes, we have to think about what comes next yeah. after that. And if you use that that amount of, of nuclear weapons in North Korea, what happens to the Korean Peninsula yeah. with that much radiation? Yeah. But the point I'd, I'd really like to emphasize is that. We have the capability to destroy North Korea without using nuclear weapons, yeah. just to reinforce Bob's, Bob's point there. And I think that I, uh, Okay, okay. <laughs> what, what, whatever you say. Uh, I mean, if you, if you factor nuclear and chemical and biological, I just don't buy that anymore. I just don't. No. Distinguished panelists. <laughs> May I ask this question? <laughs> but I think, but I think even, even more important in terms of what we do if we use nukes is the question, you know, what do we do if we don't use nukes? What if I am wrong? What do we do? And I think this notion that we can rely on nuclear deterrence, it, it, you know, it's a, it's a panacea. It's, it, you know, it, 
it, it leads us into complacency and not doing what we need to do militarily, diplomatically, economically. Yeah. I'm, I'm just tired of it. Distinguished panelists, may I ask you a question? South Korea is the world's, okay, 10th, 11th, 12th largest economic power. It will take them six to eight months to develop a nuclear weapon. The only thing standing between South Korea and developing a nuclear deterrent is belief in the deterrent that the U.S. Rock Alliance provides. Is there a chance to look that, you know, to lose that belief? In, in the value of the deterrent and the alliance, is there a chance that we might see South Korea developing nuclear weapons? South Korea is a highly developed country. They can do this in a matter of months. They only rely on our alliance. Are we fully committed to, their, to the alliance? Are we going to continue to persuade the South Koreans that they do not need a domestic nuclear deterrent? Think of political changes coming up. I'm not taking sides here, okay? Well, I mean, our capability with the with the Ohio class submarines and the P-52 bombers out of Guam and the missiles out of North Dakota and and uh, Montana. I mean, I mean that's overwhelming capability to destroy them. I mean, even General Talele was a board member on this organization in 1999. I remember him giving a briefing to the Deputy Secretary of Defense and said, numbers have a, you know, numbers have a strength of all of, of their own, but, you know, how are we going to approach this? It's going to be very draconian. And so what the degree of draconian warfare that we want to bring up, that's going to depend upon who's sitting in the Oval Office. Um, and it's not, it's not going to be an easy decision. Some things to consider here. Um, when, when a prominent Korean raised the question of uh, an independent uh, South Korean nuclear force to me. Um, I mentioned the NPT, which I realize is a piece of paper, but um, basically the only country to have withdrawn from the NPT is North Korea. Is that the company they want to keep? Do they want to see Japan go nuclear, the world's largest plutonium company? Or do they want to kick off something that is going to start a ca cascade of, uh, of other nuclear countries, nuclear capable countries that are disposable. I don't know. I don't know what the answer is, but those are some of the questions. Do they really want to tell the United States of America that 58,000 of our sons of American mothers and fathers died for nothing? Right. And the 30, 25,000 now are there in the Korean Peninsula with only one job to die for their country? So that's it. Do you see any uh, shared co-authorships or patent applications with uh, Iranians, uh, Russians, Pakistanis, or Chinese? Um, that's the first question. The second question is, um, could we get Magnitsky's shag sanctions or uh, Interpol red notices against any or all of these scientists? Well, I mean, uh, uh, the answer to the second question is it, it's possible, but I don't know how effective it would be, um, uh, particularly in terms of you know, who's controlling the exit, the border exit out of North Korea into China and then going wherever they want to go. I don't know how Interpol is going to stop that. Um, I'm, I'm more worried about sending a signal than actually arresting nuclear scientists. When North Korea starts, when the Kim regime starts falling apart and losing control, and these scientists go wherever they want to go, I don't think there, there, there's not going to be any control whatsoever. So um, I, I think that the issue is how do you, you've got to know who these people are. Sure, you have to work with Interpol and, and organizations like that. But once they cross the border across the two men or the Yalu River into China, you can't control it. Um, and that's a subject that I know quite a bit about in terms of how defectors coming from North Korea into South Korea, that's, how, that's the route that they take. And they will all tell you that they take whatever route they, they can in order to get down to places like Thailand or Laos or whatever in order to you know, eventually get back to some place in the West, usually South Korea, but they go to England, the United States, and other places. And if they go to a nuclear conference in Bern, Switzerland, and they're on the red, a red notice list. 
Or they're on the Magnitsky list. Isn't that useful? Well, I think the South Koreans will probably call off them as soon as they do. Whether they Did you see them. any call off your ships? Yeah, they'll, they'll take them and put them in Tejon. I don't know how you're familiar with Tejon, the nuclear power, nuclear capabilities of South Korea are, but Tejon is the center of it. They'll just put them in, they'll just put them in think tanks in Tejon. That's what they'll say. Did you see any co-authorships? Co-authorships? Yes. No, I don't think so. Speaking of authorships, by the way, uh, Robert Collins is going to be available to autograph signed copies of these reports. You have a full list of papers and uh, journal articles by North Korean authors. So, you know, Peter, the question about co-authorship is there, but yeah, there's no co-authorship. Uh, let me just say one more thing. I interviewed a number of nuclear scientists for this report in South Korea. How do they view their ability to make their own nuclear weapons? And they would tell me what, you know, what they think, well, well we can do this in six months. You tell me, give me the order today, our artillery will have nuclear weapons in six months in the field, ready to go. Um, the South Koreans don't need any information from from uh, the North Koreans. So the, the concept of co-authorship, whether it's strategy or science or whatever, South Koreans don't need it. They're way beyond, they're way beyond the North Koreans. Did I answer your question properly? Yes, I, I, I did a study on co-authorships of Russian scientists with overseas counterparts. Hmm. Very useful. It's the reason I'm asking. Jim Gillen. And to follow up on that, um, I believe parts of the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program did um, uh, seek to uh, to reach out to uh, scientists, uh, nuclear scientists from the Soviet Union and elsewhere, to see if they could come work here. And um, if anybody in this room knows the answer to this question, they probably shouldn't answer it. But rhetorically, uh, I would ask: Do we know? Um, any of the North Korean nuclear scientists, do they travel? Are they approachable? Um, have they been approached? Um, again, please, a rhetorical question. No, it's not rhetorical. There are dozens of North Korean nuclear scientists in Iran. And if you recall, North Korea was building a nuclear reactor in Syria, but the Israelis destroyed it because it was a city to us. And 12, 10 to 12 scientists died, or technicians died within that uh, attack. So yeah, they sent them overseas. They even tried to send them to Myanmar. There was, they tried to think that there was going to be some sort of a, a ability to, to develop them, but it, it, you know, it fell short. Grace, let's go. Well, first I have to congratulate you for writing another report that it took you 10 years, yeah. and that kind of care and making sure it was right, I really appreciate. So my question is, I don't know if you can answer it, but um, do you talk to the CIA or other um, people in the U.S. government who could really use this information so you can give them advice like, you know, don't kill that guy because he's the most influential, you know, that, that kind of advice because I have a feeling they could use it. Well, I don't talk to the CIA. Um, I, I had a clearance for most of my life up until about five years ago. I don't have any clearances anymore, so I can't talk to that. that. However, I do talk to the U.S. Forces of Korea. And I'll just leave it at that. Grace, may I say this? Everything we do is out in the open. It's in the public realm. The CIA, the NSA, the NGA, you know, whoever wants to read our reports, they're out there. Yeah. Nothing we do is a secret. Everything we do is out in the open. So, you know, welcome CIA, come and read our reports. That's it. Please do, by the way. They're pretty I, good reports. In my experience in government, just because it's out there, just because it's out there in the public does not mean people are reading it. You could lead a horse to water. That's true. <laughs> That's very true. Okay, any more questions? All right, so uh, let me say this. Uh, this is extraordinary to have all of you great and dear friends join us on Friday afternoon. I know it's not easy. Ambassador Joseph, 
Colonel Maxwell, Dr. Hodges, and of course, Bob Collins. Thank you so much. This has been a terrific panel. The one and only Chuck Downs, thank you. All of our great friends here, thank you for joining us. Uh, I don't know about you, I've had a great time. The report is already available on hrnk.org. Grace, I hope the CIA reads it and everybody else. Um, and we, we do have hard copies available. And Bob Collins has very gracefully agreed to autograph signed copies for all participants. So please come over. If you do not have an autograph signed copy, please ask Bob. He'll do it. Okay. So thank you. All of them. Thank you.